All righty. Good morning, everyone. It has been an interesting day in the market so far, but I'm going to give you a little bit of market relief. I have a very interesting individual here today. We have Mr. Andy Constant of Damp Spring. Andy has had over 35 years in the market. He has managed to find his way through the dot-com bubble, the 08, 09 crisis, and he's managed to work in so many different markets, but gain a different perspective. He's looking at the macro aspects, and I think right now in this type of environment, so many people are getting lost in the weeds, and they're not looking at the broader picture overall. Andy, would you mind giving people a uh, top-down overview of what you've done in the past and who you are and what you've got moving forward? Sure. Well, as you said, I've been doing this since 1986. Um, I started at Solomon Brothers, and it's worked at its that firm and its successor companies through 2003. And I was always uh, an equity or equity derivatives trader, convertible bond trader first, and then equity derivatives subsequent. And um, you know, I became a manager and ran the global equity derivatives business for Citi, um, which was the, the final successor company um, through 2003. Um, then I went off on my own and started a hedge fund with some um, fixed income friends from Solomon. Um, we started in 2003 and um, did fairly well. Um, I was doing equity re relative value trading, like convertible bond arm, capital structure arbitrage, um, um, vol arbitrage, um, some merger arbitrage. And um, all in relative value trading. Um, unfortunately, our partnership didn't work out. And so by the financial crisis, we had closed our business. Um, and unfortunately, I sat was sitting on the sidelines during, fortunately or unfortunately, I was sitting on the sidelines during the financial crisis, but soon after realized that all of my RV trades uh, of the past um, whether I was on the sell side or on the buy side, everything would um, um, blow up at the same time. Um, and so they talk a lot about in markets where all strategies go to a correlation of one and there is no ability to diversify during a crisis. And what I realized is those crises were generally um, created, catalyzed, whatever it might be, by macro conditions. And so I knew macro was the next place I wanted to experience. And I was blessed to get a job at Bridgewater Associates um, where I um, joined them um, in 2010. And I still think they are the premier thinkers in um, understanding how um, the world works and how it relates to securities prices, which is what I consider macro. And I really enjoyed my experience there. Um, the culture was good and bad, fit me actually fairly well, but for a variety of reasons, by the end of my time there, I was frustrated about what I was doing and so decided to leave and joined Brevin Howard, um, which is a large macro um, investor as well, um, in 2015. Um, they're extremely discretionary and they use um, derivatives positions and options very aggressively to take sort of tail risk type views, which was completely different than my Bridgewater experience. Uh, Bridgewater is entirely systematic. There is no discretion. All of the trades come from the system and what your job is at Bridgewater is to make the system better each day. Um, uh, and that goes top down from Ray, Greg, and Bob through all of the junior analysts that joined right out of college. They're all looking to make the systems better. Um, and, uh, you know, be, having that experience of a purely discretionary firm and a purely um, uh, systematic firm was, you know, a great way to see macro. Um, Alan, um, for a variety of reasons, decided to uh, move his uh, research team um, off the books of the firm and um, to save costs and um, asked me to start my own research firm, which is what Damp Spring is. It's a macro research firm primarily servicing hedge funds. And um, um, I launched that in 2019. Alan was mm -hmm. my um, first customer, still is my largest customer. Uh, that business has expanded. Um, and, um, you know, he is now paying me via commission or soft dollars, which is 
a good deal for both of us. So um, about, I guess, March of 2021, um, I had been a Twitter user for a long period of time, um, but I had really never posted anything. I sort of just watched politics and elections, some finance, really wasn't a participant in FinTwit. But I started tweeting about my thinking on macro. And, um, you know, I guess my voice, the level of my experience and the learnings I've had from prior firms and my own, my, my, the way I built um, Damp Spring for hedge fund research um, was a voice people hadn't heard before. And so I've th thankfully been able to get uh, quite a bit of following and are now up to about 50,000, a little over. And um, just love the experience, love giving back to the community. Um, most of, I do offer a, a um, paid subscription service, which is mostly because I have to gate some of the time I have because simply I cannot um, have the type of relationship I want with 50,000 people. And I do want to have a, a type, and many people seem to want to have a much uh, more in-depth relationship with me. So I gate it by, you know, offering a subscription and that's been going well um, during. And so that's really where we're at right now. Damp Spring is in, you know, again, a hedge fund. Primarily it writes research for hedge funds and levers that research with uh, both free and um, through my paid subscriptions um, with uh, the, the social media community. I like that. I like that. Andy, you've lived quite an interesting life so far, and I'm sure there are some deep pit stories that I'd love to talk with you on later on. But uh, let's let's roll back the clock a little bit. It's 1986. You're getting ready. First day on the job. Why trading? What what got you Actually, into trading? Interestingly, um, uh, that, I mean, that's a great story to start with. I started where many of my peers had started, which was in the corporate finance department. And so I was a corporate finance analyst, which was a, it was and still is a fairly intense job, um, lots of hours, lots of grinding. Um, and um, But somehow I got involved in securities valuation modeling. It was my quant background. I'm an engineer by training. Um, and, um, you know, started interacting with a variety of people on the trading floor, particularly the capital markets area where they were trying to pitch new structured product to uh, both the corporate finance client and the institutions that were buying them. And so I began a relationship. And then the crash happened, the 1987 stock market crash happened. And in early November, I got a call from the head of uh, investment banking, a guy named Jay Higgins. And. Um, I had never talked to him before. Very, very senior guy. I was 21, 22 maybe. Um, and uh, Jay said that he had assigned me to work on the Brady Commission, which was the uh, presidential appointed commission to examine what happened um, when the stock market crashed. And so me and five other um, Wall Street professionals across the vari a variety of firms um, huddled in um, the Federal Reserve Building for, along with a bunch of other staff, um, and wrote the um, uh, the Brady Commission report. Um, and, um, you know, I fell in love with trading and markets in that experience. <clears throat> Interesting. I, li I like that. that. That's a good way to get involved. And in, uh, it, it's unique how we have so many people from so many different backgrounds that come to trading. And it seems that it's the... Uh, not necessarily the volatility of the markets, but the volatility of the experience. It's really keeping you on your toes every single day, trying to figure out what's going on in the market. Uh, would you mind touching on a little bit here of really the idea of getting into market makers? It seems like after the Brady Commission and everything, you would start to have more of an understanding of not just necessarily the U.S. market, but global markets in general and how people are making those markets. Would you mind touching on that a little bit, how that came to an understanding, and then you started to work through that? Right, sure. So um, the Brady Commission um, allowed me to see um, how important understanding all of the various participants in markets behave particularly given the crash, behave under stress, but also generally behave. And then how market mechanisms that that allow the transfer of risk from one of those types of people to another 
person um, was also a great focus that I have spent time on throughout my career, which is really how, what are the mechanics of how uh, risk is transferred from one holder to another and what does it mean for price? Um, and so I've always, you know, even when I was not doing macro, I was focused on positioning and how, what triggers a change um, by an investor to decide to move his position, her position. Um, and so, um, yeah, those were, you know, extremely important lessons. At the same time, I spent my, the next 15 years as a market maker. And um, that was an interesting time for market making. It was all phone orders, prim primarily phone orders, um, and, um, you know, markets that were not as transparent as they are today. So market makers had an advantage. Um, but all the same things were happening, which is, you know, as a market maker, you need to be able to be nimble enough to um, um, and gain information from the order flow that you receive so that you can get out of the way when an order flow is going to be so large that it will move the market against you or uh, get levered, lever up when you perceive a order um, to be ending and the, the, let's say they're a seller, um, when the selling stops, that's when you want to buy. So understanding how market making, how the information content of order flow um, was, you know, something that has I've I've carried with me for my career since. I like that. We were uh, just talking with David Bullock from Arc Advisors a little while ago, and he was talking about how a trader named Sugar was trading the Japanese uh, bond market, and uh, you know he was able to push the market and everything around. Um, when we're dealing, I know with... Sugar very very well. He worked at Solomon in the ARB business, um, and uh, yeah. My trips to Tokyo often resulted in time with sugar. I was about to say, without getting uh, too in depth on some things, um, what would you say that now in this time and age, with the amount of quants we have in, with the amount of traders we have in, do you think it'd be possible to even push a market around like that anymore? Uh, it's all about order flow and what the conditions are. Um, so I think yes, I think um, markets. Um, um, you know, the, 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 the thing about markets is it's all, ultimately it's all a, um, you know, the, a classic supply and demand story, but sometimes, um, supply results in a change in the demand curve, um, as people believe that, um, that supply actually has information or is large enough to, contains information, whether it's going to be large enough to move the market or it's usually pretty good and has alpha. And so then you talk about how stable the market is. And we, as we've seen, there have been just as many periods of time in which um, markets sort of destabilize in the last 10 years as there have been in the last 40 years. So it happens all the time. And in particular, now that, <coughs> now that we're looking at um, Certain countries that are in the process of, of are, are experiencing significant declines in their currency and are in the process of potentially um, offsetting that supply um, by intervening. You um, have to look back to what the you know I think it's actually the year the twenty um, fifth. It's a it's an anniversary either today or yesterday of when Soros broke the Bank of England, and the yeah. reason why he was able to do that was that um, the Bank of England was defending its currency and we knew he knew how much currency they had to spend. And it's similar to Japan right now, where you know how much reserves Japan would need to sell in order to raise dollars, whoops, in order to raise dollars to buy, um, to buy um, yen. And so that situation repeats itself. And certainly now that the flows are large enough, I wouldn't expect an individual necessarily to break the back of Japan, but in, in aggregate, using the lessons that Soros had, you could, and not in, not in cahoots with each other, but you could expect market actors to um, essentially um, break the bank of Japan together.
I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying I, I could imagine it happening. And it's interesting how with <laughs> the <laughs> access we have to information now, I mean, the old joke was the fastest thing before was ALL Messenger, but now we have uh, TweetDeck. We have so many other ways, Symphony, et cetera, to uh, be able to talk with each other and just look and see what's going on in the market. A as we move forward into a more, I'm going to say quantitatively, not necessarily designed, but definitely acted upon market. Uh, do you think people have to have a stronger background in both mathematics and engineering to even have an edge within the market? I mean, does the self-directed person really have a chance or do they need to really dive into an engineering, a quant background to make it within the markets? Yeah, I'll just give you my experience with Bridgewater. Um, Bridgewater is not particularly quantitative. Uh, in fact, one of the, my new um, favorite followers on um, on uh, Twitter left Bridgewater a few years ago, and he, he was trained as a botanist, which is not particularly quantitative, and yet he's one of the best macro thinkers I know. Um, and um, I would say broadly, um, um, the value of a quant um, who can also think broadly, which is fairly rare. I'm a quant and I often, um, my weakness at Bridgewater was not, was thinking too narrowly. Um, and um, I'm not saying that's um, necessarily the case for all quantitative people, but it, it is at some level common. Um, and you need some people that can have some broader thinking to understand um, macro um, and understand investing broadly. Um, so, and then there's the idea of um, scaffolding someone who can speak, think broadly, who doesn't have quantitative skills with narrowly thinking um, quants. So, you know, ideally you want to have it all, but in reality, no one has it all. And so, yeah, I mean, if I had to choose a broad thinker who can think conceptually, but also can um, um, knows current tools, quantitative tools, and is capable of thinking um, very deeply on those things as well. I would think that type of person would have an advantage. Um, Jim Simons comes to mind as being sort of the the best example of you know an extreme quant who also has this capable breadth and depth um, and open mindedness. Um, so, you know, again, you can't get everything in one person. And so your job is to build something that can, in which people can work together and also um, um, cover each other's um, deficiencies. I like that. I like that. I think that speaks a lot. Uh, so let's turn it back just a little bit here. And let's, let's say hypothetically, somebody wants to get into the, uh, the banking field, the bank trading field. Now, uh, I was talking with a couple of traders that have traded with Deutsche Bank, uh, several other banks, City, et cetera. In, in your opinion, if somebody wanted to be able to stand out and let's say hypothetically they wanted to work for Damp Spring or they wanted to work for Bridge, et cetera, what makes somebody unique to even get on the desk now? You know, it's been a long time since I've hired interns uh, on the sell side. I used to run the recruiting as as uh, from the business side for Solomon. And, you know, what I was looking for were people that, um, as I described, were, you know, have a lot of things and are quantitative and capable in that way. Um, um, so, but that may have changed. So I don't have current information about that right now in terms of what I think about um, is someone who I, I'd like to have a, um, again, I'm not looking for an individual. So I'd, what I'd like to, if I were, if I were tr to hire a group of people, I would want to hire people with, um, a broad range of experiences, um, because I don't expect anybody to, um, have it all. Um, one of the interview techniques that Bridgewater uses, which I've always been, um, quite fond of is, um, and I think this, hits a lot of the questions you asked in terms of standing out is um, designed to, to test whether you are um, whether you are able to take an opinion, defend that opinion, and also um, when um, seeing that you and see that your opinion um, or your you know your synthesis of what the question is 
um, has another side to it, um, potentially pivot on the on a dime and accept that that other side is the the better the better answer to the problem. And Ray talks about that in the context of his principle, which is be open minded and assertive. Um, and so, broadly speaking, that's the type of person I want to work with. I like that. I like so being that. able to be able to identify you, it's hard to identify that without challenging people pretty hard in an interview process. Um, but I like that form of interview. That is nice. I like that. that that's good. We have, we have a lot of people in the community as well that they're just getting started in the finance field. They've been 10, 15, 20 years as a different trade. And now they go, okay, well, I want to go to this or try that. And I think that speaks highly for them. So please but take notes. I would say the opposite issue for them is, um, is making, let's assume they're, 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 they have the requisite skills to get hired by, you know, a set of firms. I think what's more important advice to them than how to get the job is how to choose what, whom you work for. Um, and I think strongly um, the most important thing one can do is um, work for someone who is who is clearly successful at advancing people above their station, meaning above the manager's station, that actually is capable of not only and has the, the the both the ability to train and the lack of ego that he can he or she can hire somebody at a junior level and and literally promote them above themselves in a way that um you know is is quite hard to do and so and yet mentor them along the path um and so finding somebody who is successful at bringing someone up at least to their level and possibly beyond is um you know critical they call it mentoring but it's really an attitude and a, and a track record that you have to try to identify is this a firm that is going to use me and burn me or is it a firm that's and an individual that I'll be working for who are trying to build a greater firm and so you know that's the type of person I want to work for I like that. I like that. And, you know, that, that speaks highly when when I was ready earlier this year to start my hedge fund, you know, I had to go out and search mentors and ask with them. And uh, it's amazing what people are willing to pass on if you just ask them overall. Would you say that maybe that is something that a lot of people do not do now is just ask the question? Seems they're scared. I've noticed that within trading as well, that some people they're scared to take the shot. So to say, have you noticed that within the markets now? You mean in terms of um, gaining what they need to be successful or in terms yes. of putting on a trade? Uh, a little bit of both. It, it seems, at least with people I've talked with, that it almost goes hand in hand that they're uh, gun shy of their own actions, uh, scared to be wrong, so to say. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, that's fatal as far as I can tell. Um, yeah. um, it... Um, um, you know, there's a difference between being annoying to people you're asking questions with and um, um, being, uh, which just consumes their time and um, being thoughtful and um, not scared, but thoughtful about how you're asking your question and for what goal it is. And actually explaining to the person you're asking, this is why I'm asking this question and then not asking it a second time. Clarification is one thing, but listening and processing and going back and then expanding on the question is a much better approach as it relates to trading you know um um the discretionary trader is a complex being um and um in that the objective of a discretionary trader is to sort of synthesize the whole world compare it to all the worlds they've seen before determine whether it's like any of those worlds, and if it's not, which is rare, um, recycling and trying to understand how it could be that it was, um, it is different. But if it's the same as prior experiences, um, using that knowledge to place a trade. And that um, is all done in one's head at some level. And so um, there are, you know, the 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 classic idea of 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 Myers Briggs, which is a 
concept that a lot of Bridgewater people relate to um, is, you know, there are people that um, shoot first and ask questions later, and then there are people that never shoot and ask a million questions. And so um, neither are great for trading. One takes no risk, the other takes, call it rash risks. And so, you know, striking that balance is something that's, you know, very hard. I, I can't give you an answer. And you, and it's fairly likely that you are a person over the years who is one or the other, who has a preference to lean to one or the other, the person who acts and the person who questions. And both have value. It's just, um, you know, you have to know who you are because if you're acting rashly, um, you're going to fail. And if you're questioning too frequently, you're never going to be on the on the field when the opportunity is actually a good one. So that's a very tough balance. I don't have a good answer for you. I know which one I am. I'm the one who is more likely to act quickly than, than um, ask a lot of questions. And I scaffold myself from that and try to prevent rash actions. I like that. I like that. That is good. All righty, Andy, I want to be respectful of your time overall. So I just have one final question for you on this one. Would you do it all over again? Yeah, absolutely. I've loved every moment of my uh, professional career, even during the incredibly difficult times. The only one I have, the only time I have not been happy is when I had a very adversarial relationship with a, what I would consider a predatory boss. But beyond that, I've loved every moment of my career and would absolutely sign up for it to do it again. I love that because we hear a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to do it again. I was burnt out or hurt, hurt yeah, something. So I'm 58 years old and I'm excited every morning to wake up and do this again. I love it. I love it. All right, Andy, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Um, follow me at Damp Spring, um, D A M P E D Spring, um, or um, go on my website and at um, dampspring.com and um, you know there's contact information there absolutely ladies and gentlemen we will have the information in the description below andy i'd love to get together with you again in five six months to see how things are going what you're thinking about the market would you be up for that absolutely happy to we didn't cover much on the market today but i'm happy to do that in the future Absolutely. Andy, thank you very much for your time and dropping some knowledge on getting into the markets. Next time we talk, would love to discuss what we're seeing in the macro view of the markets there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ruth. See you.